Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm happy to have with me once again John Kaiser. John is an independent analyst based in San Francisco. Um, he writes a wonderful newsletter, a very informative newsletter. He works extremely hard in digging deep into uh, the analysis of exploration projects. Uh, he is very highly regarded for his honest and hard work, that's for sure. Yeah, it's kaiserresearch.com. Kaiserresearch.com is where you can go to learn more about John's letter. Welcome back, John. Thanks for joining me today. Jay, I'm delighted to be back on your show. Always good to have you because I know you do work hard. Uh, you do dig deep, deeper than most newsletter writers, I would say, in, in that cover this space. Uh, and I think you have a lot of people that admire you for that. You know, we just listened to some of Brent Cook's views on his visit to Novo's gold project in northwestern Australia. And shortly after Brent visited the project, you also visited that very unusual project. So would you care to give listeners your take on this project and, and what the market is obviously, well, I mean, why the market might be obviously uh, very, very excited about it? Well, before I visited the property, um, I talked to Quentin extensively to get my head around uh, how does this area uh, compare to the Witwatersrand uh, Basin. Uh, but what really opened my eyes once I got there was we, we looked at the uh, Comet Well Purdy's Reward area. We could see the holes that the fossickers had dug. Uh, we, we actually saw people finding gold nuggets uh, and getting them out of the uh, out of the, the, the rock and mm-hmm. you know, bashing it open. Um, but it was when Quentin took me farther abroad, and, and Brent alluded to it also, he was like, we went north of where all these uh, Mount Roba salts uh, end. We went into where it's the, you know, the greenstone basement, the three billion year old rock. And mm-hmm. he showed me there these sort of remnant scabs of basalt at the edge of which it was like little mole holes uh, uh, all around it uh, where, where people had been finding these uh, nuggets. <laughs> and it was this, this sense that oh, all over the place they were finding it, where, where the stuff, where the beds weren't even properly present anymore. That's what opened up my eyes to the idea that this could be uh, bigger than uh, the Witwatersrand Reef system. And as Brent pointed out, it is different because the nugget sizes in the Wits Waterswind reefs are tiny, tiny, like one millimeter, uh, really mm-hmm. small uh, uh, types of nuggets, uh, grains in, in that deposit. Here, we have those uh, watermelon seed uh, uh, shaped and sized uh, nuggets, uh, sometimes even bigger. Uh, this is very different. And Quentin made a comment that's sort of stuck with me. And I think this is a key word. He thinks that this is the mothership region. And there may be a part of the Capval Craton, which is now missing, uh, that was the equivalent of what we've now found with the Pilbara Craton, mm. where uh, if you go farther up the slope, uh, you may have found something very similar, and that the uh, gold that's in uh, South Africa originated from something like what we're now seeing here in the Pilbara Craton, the sort of like the the super primitive source of the gold. And I certainly subscribe to uh, Quinton's uh, theory about precipitation of uh, a much higher solubility of gold in the uh, a very different water of the, of the time in the emergence of uh, cyanobacteria creating photosynthesis uh, in the shallows, uh, changing the chemistry of the water by uh, breathing out oxygen while the sun is shining the tides coming in and replenishing uh, the ocean water where the the gold has been dissolved from the entire ocean, from all those smoker systems uh, spewing stuff and even rock exposed at the the ocean Mm -hmm. surface are putting gold into solution. And then Mm -hmm. these nuggets from tiny grains and growing into these bigger nuggets in these near shore environment where there hasn't been the huge kind of sorting, like like the mature type of sorting that Brent alluded to. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're in this near shore, high energy, immature environment where these gold nuggets grew, and probably uh, if you really wave your arms, uh, eventually got farther eroded and pushed down into the the Wits area of South Africa to form those deposits. And when I talk about, you know, Wits 2.0, I'm not saying this is the same thing. Sure. Maybe if we go deep enough into the basin, in you know, the Hammersley Basin, we'll find something 
like the wits, but I'm saying it's it's wits 2.0 in the absolute massive scale because that period oh, okay. 2.7 to 2.9 billion years ago, that's the same sort of time frame as 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 the cap valves on Wits Waters Ram Basin when this uh, bizarre quantity of gold formed. Mm-hmm. Well, John, um, I believe you listened to what Brent had to say, and I, I you know, he voiced some concerns. Uh, he called a paleo stream beds, if if that's what we're looking at here, that you know there could it could be spotty. We might be seeing some things here and there. On the other hand, the, it seems pretty remarkable, as Quentin has said, that along eight kilometers they're finding these watermelon-sized shapes uh, and size nuggets. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's to be proven yet. I mean, this is, these are really early days, obviously. But it is, and Brent acknowledges, and, and Quentin, uh, Quentin, in fact, it was really interesting a long time ago. Well, when we first, uh, when this news first came out, I said to Quentin, so you really, do you think you found Wits, uh, the, the, the Wits Waters Rand deposit you're looking for? And he said, no, it's bigger and better than the Wits Waters Rand deposit. And I thought, my goodness, that's some statement for, for a, a, a well-renowned, a highly esteemed geologist like, like Quentin to make. Uh, but but what what sort of concerns might you have, John? Where could, you know, the market's gotten so excited about this thing. It's a billion dollar market cap in Canadian dollars. What might go wrong here? What could what could how could we come up empty on this thing? Well, there's a number of ways this can happen. Uh, the standard interpretation for uh, the Witwatersrand Reef is that this gold was sourced from the hinterland, uh, traditional hydrothermally uh, driven gold deposits, such as you see in. Uh, in the Tim's area and, and other places in the Greenstone Rocks, uh, 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 structurally controlled. This gets eroded, uh, you know, very acidic environment. Uh, uh, the gold gets uh, dragged through the tributaries and into the river systems, and then mm-hmm. these big braided delta system get distributed into the into the basins. And ultimately, they have almost a pinpoint type source, such as you know the California. Gold rush fields mm-hmm. from the mother load, the uh, the Klondike. Uh, yep. The fear is that this is where the gold actually came from. So what we're seeing at Comet Well Purdy's reward is one sort of narrow uh, spewing of gold from from somewhere else, uh, uh, and then maybe like 130 kilometers to the east, uh, there is the uh, the Grays area where the Loudons patch. One of these scabs that I alluded to earlier uh-huh. that seems to be covering this conglomerate bed. Um, but from from what I've seen from the distribution of, of nuggets that in, in that flat area where there isn't any more conglomerate bed, I think it is distributed over such a large area that a pinpoint traditional paleo type of source, placer type source, just isn't going to be the reality here. I think mm-hmm. this is going to be very, very big. The where it can go wrong is that the gold just doesn't concentrate high enough to be worth mining. Uh, mm-hmm. Sure, some of these things we can sort of strip mine at the surface and get the gold out, possibly mm-hmm. uh, where daylight's uh, at Purdy's Reward and Comet. Well, maybe we can make a mine chasing it right to the border. But when you start going on to the 100% ground of uh, of Novo, uh, then it starts going deeper, and you will probably have to underground mine it. Thankfully, the greenstone basement is very hard. The conglomerate itself is very hard. And this uh, Mount Row basalt uh, or whatever basalt it is that's covering it is mm-hmm. also very hard. So we should have reasonably good mining conditions. But the grade, I mean, the average South African grade is only 11 grams per ton gold. If the mm-hmm. nuggets are spaced too far apart to average out uh, mm-hmm. so that it's at least 5 grams per ton, then we end up with something like a, like Beaton's Creek, where uh, you know you can get two to three gram gold, and uh, you can open pit mine it and maybe make some money. So what could go wrong is we it, it just the grade ends up just being too low. The third thing that could still go wrong is we never come up with a reliable way of measuring this. And if we cannot do that, even though this bed may extend for 50, 60 kilometers down dip, and Quentin, by the way, Novo has about 6% of the entire Pilbara landmass uh, <laughs> uh, staked. Half of it is worthless because it's uh, exposed uh, basement greenstone where you're not going to find find anything. But mm-hmm. one of the things he's done is he's covered 
the shallower parts. If you go much farther south, where the iron companies own everything, Mm -hmm. they could conceivably be sitting on similar stuff if this uh, precipitation event was the reality, was the cause, and it happened over this vast area, and there is in this sort of a between 2.75 billion and 2.9 billion years ago, this, this gold all got created in this bed. But if they can't figure out how to measure it, nobody's going to sink 2,000 meter shafts down there to mine this stuff. So what Novo's doing now is really critical. Uh, technically, the stock is overpriced by what we know. But in every great new discovery, the market has always correctly sensed and overpriced the, based on the available information. Yeah, and you've had you have some examples that uh, you could talk about as well. A, di- a great diamond discovery. I think there's a uh, there was a nickel discovery in, in eastern Canada as well. The, these things. What you're saying is they tend. Uh, I mean, sometimes things get overpriced, and they and it's they're proven to be overpriced, and the stock falls back. But there have been some great discoveries in which it always was overpriced, right? Until finally. Uh, enough work was done and you knew what the valuation was. Yeah, Jay, I mean, the classic example was 1992 when Diamet announced the Ikati uh, Diamond Field discovery on the Slave Craton in Canada's Northwest Territories. And the Slave Craton is about the same size as the Pilbara, maybe even a little bigger. Within a year, the entire Craton was staked, even though Diamet, uh, Chuck Fipke said, no, we got it all, we got it all. Uh, Well, they did get the heart of it. The stock was always overpriced ahead of the data. And admittedly, at the time, we thought that this was going to be like uh, Botswana, where the Zhuaneng and Arapa pipes are absolutely staggering. The biggest in the world with the fantastic diamonds, a very good grade. At the end of the day, the pipes in the Northwest Territories turned out to be smaller the diamond still ended up being worth two billion dollars when BHP eventually wrapped it up. Uh, uh, Aber, which which became uh, Dominion Diamond, which got just taken out, uh, it found cluster, a cluster of pipes outside the Caddy cluster. Uh, Mountain Province in De Beers found the Gaucho Quay plus cluster. But in the beginning, when the whole thing was wide open, when we didn't know the limits, we got crazy valuations, and this is the same thing. That's happening here. So maybe at the end of the day, the uh, the, the the grade isn't good enough uh, to make a mine. Maybe the distribution isn't good enough, to, except for here and there pockets of mines. But the dream right now is that it could go all the way and be multi billions of ounces, and that at least in these shallower areas where uh, Novo is busy, maybe we will end up with like one to two ounce average grades, mm. which uh, it doesn't take a lot of tons to, to, to <laughs> put together very, very high value mines. Yeah, and when you're on surface, obviously, uh, advantages there too. Well, John, Brent, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the possibility of fine gold in the matrix. Um, and I asked Brent if he thought that Quinton would be sampling or assaying the the core, the core being drilled to test for the structure of these beds, uh, and he wasn't sure. I believe that you've spoken to Quentin maybe in the last 24 hours or so. Do you have any any insights into that? Did you pose that question with him? Yes. When they published the results from that 542 uh, kilogram sample that they had hauled out from the Produce reward pit. pit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it came in at 67 gram, which is uh, just over <laughs> two ounce per ton. But in the portion that was the so, that the so called tailings, where the, the metal detector machine didn't really uh, bleep it as containing any gold, that averaged nine grams per ton, mm-hmm. which raised the possibility that there is a fine gold component distributed within the. Uh, with, with, with within the matrix of this conglomerate bed. And uh, I, I think it was a surprise to Quinton when this came out. And at first he was cautious. And then I saw the uh, uh, in, their, in their presentation in Denver, they were talking about assessing for the fine gold component. And that's where the scout drilling that is underway now where they're stepping down dip uh, 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 to inter- find out where exactly the beds are. Um, people are hoping to get assays for that. And if there is a systemic fine gold component to this, if we're getting, uh, you know, 
four, five, six grams per ton average uh, uh, just from these small diameter holes going in there, that could be kind of a marker for where is the mineralized bed present. And then you're still going to have to go in there with your 17 and a half inch large diameter drill and get a bulk sample and assess it just the way you would a, a kimberlite dike, uh, dike for diamonds. Um, so, um, but when I talked to Quentin, he, I think they've taken enough samples from different locations to get the sense that, yes, we do have this problem of erratic distribution of gold grain size. He mentioned that in some places there's no nuggets, but there's plenty of fine gold and they get good grade. In other places, there's no fine gold uh, and they get great nuggets. Uh, so he's, I think, at this point become cautious about being able to use a uh, small diameter scout drilling as a way of uh, assessing the gold content of these beds. Uh, they've got six uh, uh, trenches going right now. Uh, they're going to collect a half ton to a ton of material that's going to be shipped uh, away to, to Perth to be processed uh, with one of those Steiner machines. The, the first milestone what we really need right now is if you go along this, uh, you know, uh, a one kilometer stretch that they've got exposed there at Purdy's Reward and you get a, a series of uh, random locations, are you going to get similar gold grade such as they get with the first one and mm-hmm. uh, i'm not quite sure when we'll get that news uh, hopefully uh you know by the end of uh end of november we'll we'll know about that but that's the first thing we're going to get away from this local freak show that they got lucky found some enriched pot yeah. we want to start seeing from multiple locations and if the uh uh, uh the scout drilling does cough back uh so sort of reasonable base load gold grades uh uh, from from a whole bunch of locations, that would be very encouraging. And that's almost more encouraging for the giant WITS 2.0 scenario rather mm-hmm. than what got right there. Because then when you step down dip and drill 500-meter holes, I mean, that's a very big distance to drill a, a large diameter hole. Nobody's going to do that. No. So no. that if, if, if there's a fine gold component to this and it can be confirmed in a reliable way, that region would go absolutely nuts because then even the iron companies can say what the hell let's drill a little, put a little straw down in there and and taste the conglomerate at the interface <laughs> between the basement and the basalt and and see if we if we got some gold there oh it's just an extremely exciting story john with about a minute left um, are there some other names in the basin there that are that might be worth people paying attention to i know de gray uh, recently uh, Kirkland Lake just took a, a small investment in DeGray. Are there some other stories there that might be worth watching besides Novo? Uh, Jay, I've created on my website a page called uh, Hillbarrow Wits 2.0 Resource Center where I'm now <laughs> listing any company that has land on the Pilbara. And as I mentioned earlier, um, half of the Pilbara is hopeless for any of this gold potential. The, the data is so sketchy and unreliable that all I'm saying is, Go to this site. Watch these, the, the, the deep digging that you mentioned that I, uh, I like to do. I'm doing that now, trying to find mm-hmm. out who actually has land that could be uh, sheltering this conglomerate bed. And my focus is going to be ones which are closer to the edges, uh, similar to where Novo is, where it's shallower. Because the deeper stuff, it's, it's, it's going to be a while before we have right. any uh, mandate to go and spend money checking stuff that's 2,000 meters deep. So oh, the rim of the uh, basin with preference to the uh, the northeastern part where the gray has and, and, and wander down there, that's the area where one should be focusing. Wander farther east toward Marble Bar and Nulagin where Novo was before. I, I think that's remnant uh, remnant uh, basin stuff. Uh, the good stuff, if it was ever there, has been eroded. And All right, John, we're going to... We're going to have to leave it go at that. It's kaiserresearch.com, right? That's where yes. people should go. All yeah, right, kaiserresearch.com. 